Okay, I hope you're enjoying your dessert and coffee and tea. Um, it is really, I'm going to try to get the formal part of the program started uh, by introducing our speaker. And, uh, and I am, I know I'm going to deprive him of his dessert, but I know he's, um, uh, the professor um, is, Professor Sandra Galea is going to be uh, fine without it for a while, so we'll, we'll, we'll get started. I just uh, returned from the States on uh, Monday. Having spent some time in the States this year, it's been a crazy time. I think those of you um, who are, are Americans are really probably looking at the elections and, and, and also all of the uh, developments in the States um, with some, uh, uh, some interest. So, but one of the reasons I wanted to spend some time back in the States with my family was to really, I have aging parents. Uh, parents who are 70s and 80s, and that's why this topic today is of great interest personally to me, to a healthier aging population in cities in the next 50 years. And one of the statistics um, I think we are all aware of is that more people uh, uh, are, gonna, are over the age of 65, and some of us are going to join that number um, you know, in, 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 in not too distant future. So I think these are issues that are of concern to most of us in this room, I know we have some students uh, here from the universities, they're not going to be as concerned about it, but I think they also have parents who are aging. And so I think for all of us, um, this topic is something that I know uh, we want to learn more about and or some of the things that we might be able to do um, to kind of mitigate. And one of the things that I kind of had to deal with when I was in the States was taking my parents to, to see doctors. And right now also, I think this last year or so, with the Obamacare, um, the healthcare system transformation changes in the United States, there's been a lot of changes. And if it's confusing enough for me, um, I know it was for my parents who speaks no English. So part of the, the, the two weeks spending with them was to kind of figure out, you know, what are they facing as they are getting older in the United States? And what are parents, you know, you know, my siblings and I, what can we do um, to help uh, their aging? Uh, and, and is technology going to play a role in it? Because the three of us are on our WeChat group, and we keep each other informed when mom and dad is getting a cataract or or other surgeries or seeing other doctors. So these are real issues that I know is not just me. I think many of my friends, um, I've heard the similar. And uh, so, so these are things that I feel... Um, even in Hong Kong, I think Hong Kong uh, is a very interesting city uh, in terms of uh, uh, the density. Um, but as uh, talking to Wilfred, uh, it is really harder for old elderly growing old here in the city as well. I mean, there are some issues, and I know uh, many of you here in this room are helping to address that. So it is really a delight for us uh, to welcome um, Professor Sandra Galea. He's the Robert A. Knox Professor and Dean of School of Public Health at Boston University. And we're delighted to have Professor Galea here to talk to us. And he is somebody who really needs no introduction. Um, he is on his way to China for a major conference, and we're delighted he's made uh, Hong Kong a stop. He is an epidemiologist and physician uh, really trained in emergency medicine, and he's interested in the consequences of mass trauma and conflict worldwide. He was named um, one of Time Magazine's scientific mind for social sciences. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Time Magazine's epidemiology innovators, and listed as one of the world's foremost um, scientific minds for social sciences by Roy Thomson Reuters. So he also served on the National Advisory Council on Minority Health and Health Disparities, and is a member of National Academy of Medicine and American Epidemiological Society. He has a medical degree from University of Toronto, and he a graduate degree from Harvard University and Columbia University. So it is really my delight to uh, welcome Professor Sandria Galea to, uh, to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice, for that uh, kind introduction. And thank you all for uh, coming and um, being here with us uh, over lunch. So i uh, delighted to be here. As Alice mentioned, we're on our way to the US-China Health Summit in uh, Xi'an um, tomorrow. And it was great to be able to make a stop here in Hong Kong. As I've been uh, saying to many people in uh, the drinks and over lunch, Hong Kong is a very interesting place to do this kind of talk because you represent a um, almost an, a vanguard in how the world is changing, a, uh, a forward path in where the whole world is going to get to. And in the context of thinking about 
cities and aging, which is what I'm going to talk about, there really is no, uh, no place probably that represents as much these forces coming together as does Hong Kong. So I want to give you, I'm gonna talk for only 15, 20 minutes. I really would like to give you a synthesis of where the world is headed and how I see this creating real challenges, but also real opportunities. And I want to suggest ways in which we can prepare to create a healthier world. So having said that, let me plunge in. See if this works. Okay, so here's the premise. The premise is very simple. That city living is the most important demographic shift of our generation. Now, it's actually hard to overstate how important this is, but let me just try to put it in context. In 1800, 5% of the world's population lived in cities. Now, we're all human, so we tend to think in terms of our own lifespan. So 1800, 200 years ago seems like a long time ago. But it's important to remember that from a human lifespan, that is a blink of an eye. We've gone from 5% to, as many of you know, more than half the world's population living in cities. But the transition didn't happen until about three, four years ago. But now let me give you just a graphic which I think brings this home. So this is, um, this is the world, and what I'm doing here is I am color coding the countries of the world where at least half the world's population is living in a city. And I'm starting from 1960, not that long ago. So this starts 1960, 1970, 80, 90, 1000, 10, So by 2050, and 2050 is not that long from now, you will have almost all the countries in the world will have the majority of their population living in cities. So what does that mean? It means that city living becomes what we would call in science the modal way of living. Now for those of you who don't remember math from high school, I'll remind you what mode is. Remember mode is when you have four numbers, number five, seven, seven, nine. Seven is the mode, because it's the number that happens most frequently. That's what city living is. It's become the number, the experience, that happens most frequently for all of us. Now that is an extraordinary transformation in the past 200 years, and also an extraordinary opportunity. Because when you stop and think about it, what other human experience is so ubiquitous and shared by people all across all these countries? other than city living. So this creates then a opportunity and a set of challenges that are shared by people across cultures, across economies, across ways of living. And for anybody who's interested in health, as I am, it creates then a potential way in. It creates a potential way for us to tackle health and say, huh, there is a way in which we can do something about a ubiquitous experience, city living, to improve the health of populations. Here's a, another simple way of looking at this. This is uh, a simple graph, but uh, I show this just to show you it's been, we've been increasing the proportion of people living in cities exponentially since 1950. Now, why am I here? A couple of people said to me, well, why are you in Hong Kong? Well, I'm in Hong Kong for the reason I said, which is that um, if you're interested in this, you can't avoid Asia. Now, why can't you avoid Asia? So here's Asia. So these are the where the urban people are living in the world. So what you see here is uh, China has half a billion people living in cities, with about 42% urban. Uh, India has about uh, 300 million people living in cities. No other countries come close with the exception of the United States and Brazil, but both of which are smaller than China and uh, India. So when you look at all of Asia, you have a almost a half of the world's urban population is in Asia. So if you're interested in cities, and you're interested in improving the health of populations as I am, Asia is the epicenter of this. And as I'm gonna talk in a second, if you're interested in the intersection of cities and an aging population, Asia is even more the epicenter. This is where it's happening. And Hong Kong, in its own small way, is very much a emblematic of where the whole region is going. I'll show you a couple of more slides to make the point about Asia. This is um, the urban agglomerations around the world. And just looking at a few countries and looking at what percent of these countries are, are uh, urban. Singapore is 100% urban, of course. Um, uh, Japan is about 91%. Um, uh, China is right here in the, in the middle, uh, right there, there's 50, 50%. So you, you get a sense. You have some countries that are still coming, but this is uh, 
the percent urban in a lot of Asian countries. But this, this last slide is the one that sort of uh, makes this case for me. That uh, by 2025, and, and just to be clear, 2025 is uh, in the annals of human experience is a blink of an eye. That's tomorrow. So by 2025, 70% of Chinese will live in cities with more than 1 million people. Not just cities. Cities of more than 1 million people. Now, although for China, that scale is almost normative, for the rest of the world, a city of more than 1 million people is a very large city. Just to put it in context, Canada only has three cities of over 1 million people. And in China, 70% of people live in cities of more than 1 million people. And by 2030, China is going to add 400 million people in cities, which is roughly the size of the entire American population. So by 2030, which is 15 years from now, hopefully we shall all be alive to see 15 years from now, China will have the entire US of new people living in cities. And India, just talk about India, will have another 200 million city dwellers, which is more than the population of Spain. This is just to give you a bit of a sense of how much you all here are sitting right in the middle of this enormous demographic shift. And in terms of large cities, I do want to point out that the largest of these cities actually are not in China. The largest cities are, uh, this is Tokyo, you have Delhi, you have Dhaka, you have Kolkata. Shanghai is the, is the first one, which is actually one, three, four, five down. You have a lot of these v enormous large cities in, um, um, in India in particular. And uh, what China has is a disproportionate number of over one million sort of large, medium large cities, right, in these extraordinary large cities. So, the message is simple. City living is the most important opportunity that we have to promote health. Now, I want to just use an example and say, okay, well, how can we then think about cities in a health-promoting way? How can we think about how are cities producing health? And uh, let me see if I can walk in. Can you hear me when I walk? This work? Okay. So, I want to use one health issue just by way of illustration. And I was actually um, uh, just having a conversation at uh, lunch, which makes this point. I was having this conversation about obesity. It's always good to talk about getting fat when you're eating. I find that uh, it, it clarifies the mind. And then you say, please, have another roll of bread. Um, uh, the, um, so let's talk about obesity. Everybody here has heard that obesity is a problem. So I will start with, I'm going to use this as an example. So we we are getting fatter. Everybody knows that. And uh, my favorite uh, picture that shows how we're getting fatter is this. This is um, uh, Fat David. Um, uh, I don't know if any of you have read, lately there's been a problem with David's ankles. They had to take him down. And it's really because of his un not well-documented obesity problem. Um, so I want to show you obesity in the country where I live, in the United States. And uh, I, I could show you data like this in China, but um, I want to show you the U.S. I'm going to pick on the U.S. for a second. So I want to explain the epidemic of obesity in the United States. So here's the epidemic of obesity in the United States. So this is the United States. And the way this works is I am coloring in the states. The darker the state, the more obese they are. So this is 1990. Everybody see that? And the darker color is about 10 to 15% obese, okay? So it's 1990. That's 92. Now notice all of a sudden we have a 15 to 20% area. 94, 96, 98. Now we've introduced a 20 to 25% states. 2000, 2002. Now we have introduced 25 to 29% obese. 4, 6, Eight. Oh, we've now introduced more than 30% obese. 10. That is the spread of obesity in the United States. You will all agree how much that looks exactly like an epidemic. Right? We have this enormous spread of obesity in the United States. Now, how long did that take? Did people catch when I started? I started in 1990. Looking around this room, I think everybody was born in 1990. Not that long ago, right? So the United States has gone from a country where the, where the state with the highest burden of obesity was 14% to a country where you have a lot of states with more than 30%. Essentially, we've tripled our burden of obesity. Now, why did this happen? Like, why did this happen? Well, what's driving this? Do you think it's our genes? How many of you think it's our genes? Nobody's raising their hand. Well, if you're going to think it's our genes, you have to make a case that our genes have changed 
threefold in the past 25 years, right? Now, nobody's really making that case. Of course not, because our genes have not changed. Everybody knows this. Our genetic stock as humans, for the length of time humans have been on this planet, which really is a blink of an eye, has not changed. So it's not our genes. It's not our genes that's driving this. It's unlikely that's our genes. What is driving it, probably, is the world around us. So what do I mean by the world around us? Well, that's what I mean by the world around us. That is America. Um, uh, I don't know what driving is like here in Hong Kong. I suspect it's not very good. Um, I suspect there's a lot of that too here, um, although probably smaller roads. But um, that, is, that, that, that is the world around us. Now, why does that matter to obesity? Well, here's why it matters to obesity. Here's one example. This is a very simple graph that shows the percent of trips that Americans make compared to Germans using different modes. So these are Americans and these are Germans. The dark bar is bicycling and the white bar is walking. So what you see is Germans, as they get older, take more trips by bike and walking. You see that? Until over 75, almost 60% of your trips are either biking or walking. Look what Americans do. Well, nothing, actually. <laughs> we, we <laughs> <laughs> the bottom line is we don't move. Um, uh, so is this because Americans are constitutionally different than Germans? Well, not really. It's the same genes, remember. What it is is the environment. We have built an environment in America which does not in any way encourage exercise. That is the world around us, and that's the world that has changed over the past 25 years. Here's something else that's changed. This is uh, countries with a McDonald's in 1965, 1980, 1995, 2010. Now, I don't work for McDonald's, but if I did, I would, of course, make sure I target there and maybe Greenland, although not that many people in Greenland. So um, what's the point I'm trying to make? The point I'm trying to make is that to improve health, we need to improve the world around us. There is no question about that. And I, I want to be very clear about this because this is, you either knew this coming in or else this should change your view of health because there is a very reflexive tendency to think of health as something that's in your genes, that's in you. And I am here challenging that. I am telling you that your health has very little about what's in you. It is about what's around you, which is a very different paradigm. And I want to use a metaphor to, to make this case. And this is a quote from someone else. And I want to read this. To say that genes are responsible for obesity is generally no more or less correct than to say that genes are responsible for drowning. Because after all, all drowning is genetic. You cannot drown a fish. So here's the point, right? Gene, fish cannot drown because they have genes that prevent them from drowning. Humans can drown because we don't have the same genes fish have. But nobody thinks drowning is genetic. We realize that drowning is because you don't have safety. You don't have somebody to pull you out of the water because you don't know how to swim. It is the same with obesity. It is the same with the vast majority of things that make us sick or that keep us healthy. Now, the reason this paradigm is important is because once you recognize that we are all becoming much more urban, you realize that this then represents an opportunity to change the factors around us that may make us drown or that may help us swim. And that ultimately is what's going to make us healthy. So the question then becomes very simple, which is how can we create healthier cities? And this is now where this intersects with the other sentinel demographic change of our time, which is population aging. So this graph is actually seismic in its implications for the world. And uh, whenever I show this to an audience who doesn't know this, I always sort of get, people are quite surprised. So in 2015, we started having more people over age 65 in the world than people under the age of five. And sometimes I show this and people say, well, well, you surely you're not including places like Africa. No, no, this includes everywhere. It includes world over. And look what's going to happen over the next 10, 15 years. I mean, by 2030, we'll have one third more. By 2050, we'll have about twice as many people over age 65. Now, that is an extraordinarily different world. A world where you have twice as many people over age 65 than, over, than 
under the age of five is an extraordinarily different world than not so long ago here in 1950, where we had three times as many people under the age of five. And of course, one of our challenges as humans is that our image of our context is very much shaped by our memories. And I'll ask you all to think about the world. You, think, you see the world through your experiences and your lens and your cultural norms. And those lens and the cultural norms is all rooted here. But that's not the world we're in. We're actually here. So the world is changing. So two enormous demographic shifts, urbanization and population aging. And they're both coming together at the exact same time, which is, depending on your perspective, an extraordinary challenge or a tremendous opportunity. I'm sort of a, 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 a by choice, a political optimist. So I'd like to actually take a pragmatic approach and say, well, this could be an opportunity. So where do we take this? How does this then become an opportunity? Accepting that cities are ubiquitous, accepting that if we improve our environment, we can improve our health, and accepting that more and more of us will be older than cities, how then do we improve cities to create a healthier world for an aging population? Now, that's a big question. And um, the problem with that question is that it becomes a little bit of, well, how can we do everything for everybody all the time? Which, which is really difficult. It's very difficult to wrap your brain around that. So I find what's useful is to break it down and say, can we break down this notion of how cities may affect health to guide then what innovation we may want to embrace to answer the question, how can we create healthier cities for an aging population? So what are the aspects of cities that shape health? And there are many different frameworks that you could use for this. And I, I just thought I would use the framework from the United Nations. This is from the UN Habitat Report, which um, I was one of the co-authors of, which um, says there are four aspects of cities that shape health. And uh, I don't know that this framework is necessarily the best one, but it's probably as good as any. It's probably as bad as any, but it's, uh, I think it serves its purpose. The natural and built environment, the social and economic environment, food security environment, and health services environment. So four environments. The physical environment, social environment, food environment, and the health system environment. Which if you think about it, if you stop and pause for a second, you know, that roughly captures the world around you. That captures the city around you. That captures Hong Kong around you. It's a physical space. It's a social space. There's food and air and water. And there is health systems. So how can we think about each of these as opportunities? How can we innovate within each of these four spaces to create healthier cities for an aging population? So let me just talk about each one and just show a couple of illustrations on each one. And then I'm going to close. So let's start with the built environment. So how does one improve the built environment to the end of creating healthier cities for an aging population? This is, as far as I'm concerned, in some respects, the lowest hanging fruit. It is some of the most obvious changes that can happen in cities are in the physical environment. In many respects, because we can see the physical environment. It's easy to see the physical environment. And I'm giving you here a couple of examples. So one of the principal ways in which people over 65 end up get becoming unhealthy, and I'm choosing my words carefully, is falls. And falls, we have, this is part of our shift in thinking. We have thought of falls as being something intrinsic, as though I fall because of me. I don't fall because of me. I fall because my environment is designed in a way to facilitate my falling. Similarly, an environment can be designed to facilitate my not falling. There are very good studies that show things, for example, like healthy sidewalks. Sidewalks that are specifically designed to be lower, have a lower rise, have non-slip pads that can reduce falls tremendously, reduce the morbidity and then mortality of the elderly tremendously. Now, for any of you who sort of have thought, you know, this is not really a big problem, I guess the setup to, this, to, to, to the talk thus far is to make it clear this is a big problem. This actually is how the whole world is going to be living. This is where the majority of the world's population is going to be, over 65, living in cities. So the notion of healthy sidewalks doesn't become a fringe idea. This becomes a mainstream idea. It, it is as mainstream an idea as having traffic signals that work if we actually want to maintain a healthy population. Guides to healthier urban environments. Digital approaches to point out opportunities 
for engagement with healthy aspects of urban environments, remembering, of course, that the population of people over age 65 that is entering the world now is much more digitally connected than it ever has been. So there's a large number of ideas on improving the urban physical environment. I want to just show you one set of slides that really hopefully will imprint this in people's minds. This is, um, this is the city of Naples, Florida in the um, um, uh, United States. And uh, I just want to show you, this is what an American city tends to look like, sort of terrible. And, um, but with a few overlays, this can transform quite rapidly. So that's Naples right now. Now you're adding trees. Now you're adding a median and a slow speed lane. Now you're adding sidewalk, street trees, and parked cars. And now you're actually adding shop fronts. That transforms a city in five ready steps from a place where you need to have a car, where you cannot walk, which was the initial data I showed you, to a place which is welcoming and hospitable as a physical environment and also a social environment. So that's one example. Now how about the social environment? So the social environment is uh, trickier because it's harder to see, it's harder to, to map out, but the social environment is every bit as influential as our physical environment. We have abundant data that shows that your friends make you fat. Now why is that? Well, it's simply because eating and exercise patterns are social activities, very clearly documented. So can we harness, in particular, the new wave of digital technologies, including personal health maps, and I have here this notion of health Foursquare. Foursquare is a very popular app in the United States that uh, helps you figure out which establishments you want to frequent, but which establishments are promoting a healthier social space. Can we do that for promoting health for elderly populations in cities? Here's one example. This is uh, a, one very particular example of a health map, which is a global health map, looking in particular here at real-time transmissibility of infectious disease worldwide, collected from people on the ground. It essentially is using the same technology as uh, Google uses for uh, traffic by actually collecting information from phones to tell you where there are traffic jams, doing the same thing to create a health map about where you are more or less likely to contract something like influenza. That's the social environment. How about the food environment? So we don't often think about food. We don't think about food very much, particularly those of us who live in high-income countries who take it for granted that food is safe and that we can eat whatever we want. Um, but we forget, that's why I showed you the obesity example, and I'm tying these back to the examples I showed you, that for the vast majority of the world's population, the world's urban population, the world's aging urban population, choice of food and the provision of healthier alternatives is enormous, enormously determinative of whether people are going to be fat or not, healthy or not. I'll show you a couple of maps on this from uh, New York City. So this is um, New York City, and uh, this is a map of obesity in New York City. And the darker the color, you see the darker, the more obesity. So this is uh, over here, you see there's more obesity in the South Bronx and Central Brooklyn. And um, what is that linked to? Is that linked to um, different people? Or is that linked to different structures within which they live? So I'll show you two other maps now that are directly linked to this map. One is a map of walkability in New York City, and the other one is a map of where there are stores that sell healthy food. So number one, here's walkability. This is a map actually of real-time walkability because this is a study that we had done where we give people um, sensors and we can actually map where they've gone, where they've walked. And what you see is walkability in New York City here is Manhattan. This is when, when you're a tourist in New York City, you only go to Manhattan. So you think that's all of New York City, but in fact it's not. It's a very small part of it. But this highly walkable, and the areas where there's more obesity are much less walkable. It's actually very simple. And then you look at another map. This is another map of where you have need for supermarkets to sell healthy food. And what you see here is the darker the color, the higher the need, and they're exactly in the areas where you have more obesity. So it's one clear example about how we can improve the food environment and relatedly the exercise environment to create healthier cities. And fourth is the service environment. So the service environment is um, frequently forgotten when we try to think about how we create healthy cities. But, and, and the reason it's frequently forgotten is because 
we are not very good at creating systems of health. We are very good at creating high-end hospitals that exist by themselves. But creating systems that make for health, we are much less good at. But we have the potential to do so through the creation now of linked network systems, including things like personalized health access and structures like virtual hospitals. Many of you are involved in this, and this is just one example about um, virtual treatment for mental health, which is, has been shown in the United States to be extraordinarily successful. The bigger, biggest problem here is not one of lack of imagination and lack of use of technology, although we think it is, because there actually is an abundance of innovative thinking about this. In Boston, where uh, I live, uh, the, the, the area of digital technology is burgeoning, and there's a lot of solutions. The problem is not the individual app and individual solutions. The problem is the integration and the political and the, the political will and many times the financial incentives for individual hospitals that operate on their own profit motive to have a rationale to be part of healthier systems that actually promote health in cities. And in many respects, it is a higher order challenge and it's a political and resource challenge much more than it's a challenge of the individual innovator. And I suppose then it becomes a, a challenge of bringing the individual innovators together in a way that makes their innovations possible. So I'm gonna stop because I really wanna take questions, but here's the future as I see it. And uh, I, I, I welcome challenges to this if people see a different future, but I, I, I must confess, I, I, uh, I think I'm right on this. Uh, it's, uh, I think we are gonna end up with sustainable cities that promote health of its residents by manipulating the key elements of the health of its populations. Now I'm using the word manipulate here intentionally because the word manipulate almost gives us a certain unease. They say, well, how could my, I don't wanna be in a city that manipulates me. Well, I'm here to tell you that you live in a city that manipulates you. We all do. Our environment manipulates us all the time, whether we like it or not. So the argument is we might as well have an intelligent manipulation to the end of improving health by recognizing that we are living in cities more and more, we are aging in cities more and more, so might as well structure our physical environment, social environment, and our service environment to manipulate our behavior, what we eat, what we drink, what we do, our interactions and our use of systems towards the end of making us healthier. In, uh, in the US about 20 years ago, there used to be in, uh, a, a fair bit of intellectual discussion about this notion of the urban health penalty, about how living in cities confers a disadvantage, how we had people dying more, living less in cities. And over the past decade, I've been part of a, a movement and a sort of a stream of um, thought that really is trying to change this into the urban health advantage. And I do think there is an extraordinary advantage in having the ubiquity of urban form around us. Not just around us, but around everybody in the world. And, and I think it is, we are really on the precipice of an extraordinary change in what the world looks like, which ultimately is going to be older and urban. And the time sort of is now to harness our thinking around it to create healthier physical spaces, social spaces, food environments, as well as health systems. I will stop there and I will take uh, questions. Thank you for having me. Richard Ward. Uh, my questions relate to uh, your, your maps of obesity, and uh, I, I've, I've heard it said that one of the reasons for obesity is the subsidy for growing corn and uh, sugar products, and, and so, you know, from a public health perspective, wouldn't it make more sense to subsidize the growth of green vegetables? Um, yes. Yeah. So, um, is this on? I don't know if this mic is, uh, okay, now it's on, good. Uh, the answer is, uh, the, so, so there are two answers. The answer is yes. It absolutely makes, it makes sense to subsidize growth of green vegetables. And if you think from a bigger picture perspective, 
the drivers of obesity ultimately are political and economic, like the subsidies on corn. Now, you said something else interesting in your question. You said, isn't the best approach or something like that? I may be paraphrasing. And, and, and that's a very interesting part of your question because then it the, the becomes, well, what matters most? If you were to invest in something, what are you going to invest in? Should you be investing all your resources in making the effort to change the subsidies on corn, shift it to vegetables? Or should you be doing some of these things I'm pointing, uh, I'm pointing out here? And I have come to feel that um, the what matters most question needs to be turned on its head into how can we tackle the problem from multiple aspects without forgetting what matters most. So there's no question that taking it down to city living, that me telling you not to have dessert has some impact. The argument I'm making is that doesn't matter as much as us, us having healthier food to begin with. And that probably doesn't matter as much as the subsidies that are ultimately producing the food generation, right? But all matter at their own level. So it's a question of what is pragmatically possible, what is politically feasible, and how do we act on what is ultimately going to make a difference. And that is a very complicated scientific values and political question. My second question is, what do you see in Hong Kong that's transmissible as a model to other urban environments? It's a good question. What, um, probably the biggest thing that I see in uh, Hong Kong, which probably is uh, achieved through um, scale, because it's a small, compact place, is, um, is a, an intelligent use of space, by and large, that uh, promotes the existence of green space despite the sort of this enormity of sort of concrete that surrounds everything. And that's actually quite, it's quite unique. It's, it's hard to remember that when you're in Hong Kong. It must be hard to remember you're in Hong Kong. But um, I, I, I know no other place in the world, possible exception of Singapore, that uh, has actually been so thoughtful about trying to inject green in a, in a city. And uh, I think Hong Kong has been very good at that. I think Hong Kong has been, in my assessment, quite poor about many of the other aspects of improving the physical environment to create healthy city. But the use of green space in Hong Kong is actually quite, um, is quite smart and thoughtful. Okay, over there. Um, you, in your model on changing the Naples, Florida, and mm. the landscape to promote walking, to promote that type of healthy lifestyle, and in the United States, there seems to be this cultural mindset that rather than walking down the block, I'm going to drive down the block. How does this, or how do you see that changing of mindset to once you give the opportunity to become more healthy, the ability for the community to change that mindset or lifestyle to take advantage of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I think the question really gets at the fact that all our behaviors ultimately are... Um, a complex dynamic system that interacts with our environment. So I, I tend to use myself as an example to answer that question, which, you know, I'm, I'm lazy fundamentally. So if, if my structure is such that I could just sit on the couch and eat potato chips, I probably would. Um, um, and if it's in any way difficult for me to go outside and walk, I probably wouldn't. But once you make it so easy that it's actually embarrassing for me not to do it, then I will actually do it. And maybe you're all different than me, but that's how I am. And uh, so I actually do think cultural mindset changes once the opportunity changes. I think the harder part in your question is as follows, is that we think we have a culture and a mindset, and that culture and mindset determines our political choices, which then creates the incentives for policymakers as to what they should do. Right? So if, if, if those who are in, in a position to change environments are reacting only to the culture of today, we are never going to move to creating environments for tomorrow. And, and that is, of course, a chronic problem with any political system. So in part, I see it as the role of the academy to try to make these arguments to shift that mindset so we can look forward. I, have, I wanted to ask you one question in terms of the role of government. Yeah. Um, you talk about cities, and I think right now, one of the examples I saw, you mentioned also New York. Well, when I was living in New York, I mean, under uh, you know, a mayor, uh, bike lanes um, mm -hmm. popped up in within, what, five years? And now it is still very much a uh, uh, part of uh, New York's um, environment these days. But the role of uh, governments, is it, you know, if something like this? Is it uh, federal, uh, city? Blow? I mean, you know, yeah. the, those are interesting questions. Yeah, I think it really depends on the political structure of a place. So in the United States, some of you may have read that uh, we have political gridlock at the national level, so nothing happens nationally. I believe they haven't passed the law in the past 10 years. 
Um, uh, and what's happened is um, there's been a lot of devolution of these decisions to municipal governments. Municipal governments have been uh, become quite important, and there's been a movement towards cities being way out front ahead of the federal, uh, federal government. And that is, in many respects, a real reflection of the political structure in the United States, regrettable or not, leaving aside whether it's desirable or not. So I think it really depends. And, and I think a, um, a broader national system can make some of these moves. I think um, a more state or provincial government, or in certain cases, municipal. It's also, in the US, I'll tell you about the US example, it's really complicated because, for example, New York City has far less autonomy than do some other cities because of statute, a lot of uh, decisions, particularly on taxation, New York City cannot pass. They actually have to be done at the state level. While other cities, for example, Philadelphia, they have capacity to change taxes, which New York City does not. So it really depends on, um, on statute, statutory rea realities as well as political realities. Um, Dr. Gallier is um, Edmund Lee from Hong Kong Design Center. We are very interested in how design is deployed, you know, to solve, you know, the big problems. But when when you're talking about, you know, to, um, this magnitude, you know, integrated approach to solve, you know, the future problems, I think we need to, um, um, super facilitation, you know, uh, um, to navigate, you know, this ecosystem. You know, to, you're not just talking about deploying science, technology, or health research. You're 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 talking about you know, how the different dimensions, cultural, social, food, you know, the built environment are integrated you know, to solve something. How ready are we? You know, it could be the urban planners, could be the policy makers, could be the educators. We are not even trained to think with that you know, term, yeah. uh, um, horizon. So let me make a couple of comments. Um, let me start with design, then I'll move on to the training part. So I'll start with design. I think um, design stands to play an enormously important role here. I think design can create a principally visual language that sets where we want to get to aspirationally. So I actually think that design, to go back to the culture question, can be at the forefront of changing culture and changing how we think. If you look at some of the, more, the most progressive uh, spaces anywhere in the world, they are design forward and they, through their design, tell us and create a language that suggests how we may think of the space in order to promote pro-health or pro-social behavior. So that's on the design front. Then the question is, well, we're not even educated to think this way. And uh, that's a real challenge. There's no question about it. I, um, I, I think 97% of people in this room are not educated this way, including myself. I, th this, is, this world is changing now. When I went to medical school, this was not the world we're in. We're actually in the world of the future. But we have a responsibility to do two things. One is to be, is to adapt and to think ahead despite the limitations of our training. And secondly, to make sure that we create the education in whatever sphere we're in so that the next generation thinks this way and thinks this way fast. Because those changes, remember, a change that's happening in 15 years is really fast. It, for any of you who are involved in any educational enterprise, you'll know, I'm in, I'm in the business of higher education, a student we train today will be the leader in 15 years. So in 15 years, remember, we're going to have a third more people over 65 than under the age of five. So if we train our students today to think of the world the way it is today, she will be completely unprepared for the world when she's actually leading. So there's a real responsibility of on leaders in education, and by that I mean across sectors, to prepare the next generation for the different world. Now, perhaps that was different in the in the 18th century when the world was changing more slowly. But that is the case when the world's changing as rapidly as what I'm showing you here. Uh, one last question. Thank you, I'm Bjorn Sekerblom. Uh, how could we better and wider engage young generations into all these aspects of aging? The reason I'm asking, I think everybody here in this room knows that seeds to chronic diseases being the biggest burden upon elderly and upon society are planted when we are young. But quite frankly, when I was younger, I couldn't care less. Yeah, so it's a very good question. So I, I think uh, there is one thing that's uh, one of my favorite aphorisms is that um, one of the differences between, uh, you know, one of the reasons for, uh, for generation gaps is that uh, 
the old all remember what's like when they were young, but the young have no idea what it's like to be old. And um, I think uh, I think it's very clear that the young do not care about the, the old, and um, I don't think we're going to change that. So I say don't, we don't even try to change that. But what the young care about is cities. So I say forget about getting the young to care about the fact that the world is aging. And let's get the young to care about cities. It's, it's the same thing. It's going to achieve the same effect. I said I was a pragmatist. Um, uh, so I actually think that... Um, I. I Again, being in, in sort of graduate education, which is what uh, our school of public health does, uh, it's, it's very difficult to get a 25-year-old interested in 65-year-olds. So one obviously needs to make sure that the topic is available. But what the young care about is all these things that I talked about because they want to have healthier, better spaces. So I think we focus on that and that will achieve the same end. There may be not perhaps a, a rousing, optimistic answer, but I think it's an answer that will get us to where we want to get to. On that happy note. Uh, I want thank to you thank Professor Gallier for his wonderful uh, presentation and uh, and hope to welcome you back after your trip, uh, you know, at China. But one of the questions I have for you right now is you mentioned in the statistics uh, China's uh, 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 role in terms of the uh, uh, large cities. And those of us who remember going to China in the 80s, uh, bicycle was such mm -hmm. a big deal in China. And now we could hardly see any. Mm -hmm. And so some of the changes, do you think some of the changes in mm -hmm. China – uh, the young or the old, whoever, mm -hmm. you know, will look back and, and realize that they're, you know, the, the gridlock is really not the future of a city's growth. So the role of yeah. Asia and China in terms of yeah. facilitating some of these uh, thinking. Yeah, I, th I think there's no question about that. I think there is a, um, there's a challenge as cultural norms spread and diffuse and, uh, and uh, that certain cultural norms are adopted that are actually a bad idea. They were a bad idea in the countries that, uh, that pioneered them and uh, the predominance of the Motor vehicle, for example, which is a, which is an American cultural export, is in 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 the whole was a mistake. If people actually look, America is thought of as being inexorably linked with the car, which is nonsense. If you look at history, in the fifties there were explicit decisions made in the United States to invest in highways rather than to invest in uh, high speed mass transit. These were conscious decisions that were made, which put America down that path, and it was actually a wrong path. So it's a pity to see that being picked up by other countries when hopefully you'd think that that each country should be able to learn from the other country's mistakes so as to not to make them again. I'm not sure that sometimes we succeed in that. So, yes, I think that your point about China is well taken. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here. And I want to thank uh, Professor for being here and have a great trip to China. And we look forward to welcoming you back thank in you. the near future. Thank you. Thank you.